everyone. I am Desiree Fabroa from 1FME. I'm going to introduce the chapter 2 which is the content and contextual analysis of a selected primary sources. The complete knowledge of the past through credible sources is essential to the understanding and learning of the student of their own history. History must be studied carefully because it is the important application of the historical method. Historical method is the process of critically examining and analyzing the records and survival of the past. To intent of the application of historical method is to make the student competent in their interpretation of facts and critical analysis of historical narrative or account. For this to be achieved, a student will be engaged in content and contextual analysis of selected primary sources. The students will be identified the pertinent information from the text or document and explain its importance of their understanding of history in the Philippine city. Contextual analysis, or on the other hand, considered specifically the time, the place, and the situation when the primary sources was written. The analysis as well included the uh, author's background, the authority on the subject and intent perceptible, and its relevance to the meaning of people and society today. The approach essential to the enhancement of the student analytical and critical thinking skills and their ability to articulate the views on the selected primary sources in this chapter. Moreover, for this to be realized, the selected primary sources which will be utilized and provided and introduced separately with the brief descriptions for each lessons. In this chapter, we have a five lessons. Lesson 1 is the first voyage around the world. It will be reported by Miss Micaela Eli Harde. Lesson 2 is the custom of Tagalog. It will be reported by Miss Miji Iligan and Miss Ivy Gardigo. Lesson 3 is the work of Juan Luna and Fernando Amarsolo. It will be reported by Rochil Hayag. Lesson 4 is the political caricatures. It will be reported by Miss Arian Maital. And the lesson 5 is the speech of Corazon C. Aquino. It will be reported by Miss Arabella Tagana. First Voyage Around the World by Atonio Pegafeta is one of the primary sources in readings in Philippine history. He was born sometime of the closing year of the 5th century. His parents is Giovanni Pegafeta and Angela Zoga. His eldest among his siblings of two. He was a native of Vicenza, a town about a hundred west of Venice, Italy. Hello everyone, I'm Mikaela Baya Elihorde, and I am the first reporter to the Chapter 2, Content and Contextual Analysis of Selected Primary Sources. So the lesson 1 was titled, The First Voyage Around the World. The first voyage around the world was written by Antonia Pigafetta. The first voyage around the world was written on board one of the fifth ship that was first to circumnavigate the world during the expedition that was led by Ferdinand Magellan. The expedition was started in 1519 and ended in Spain in 1522. The name of the Spanish fleet that was led by Ferdinand Magellan is Armada de Moloca and it was provided by King Charles V of Spain. The details of the world first circumnavigation were currently recorded in the journal of the Italian chronicle Antonio Pegafetta. This chronicle serves as the lens through which the voyage of circumnavigation of the globe can be fully comprehended. It provides crucial information on the discovery of the islands and the people who live there. This people were to be the great ancestors of Filipinos who lived peacefully and abundantly in the area. The Chronicle of Pegafetta allowed for a better understanding of these people's cultural lives. So, this topic is all about the narrative of Antonio Pegafetta of the voyage which is translated by Lord Stanley of Alderley. However, only the necessary and important details of the narrative were taken based on what is useful for us, for students. 
As I said earlier, they began the expedition in 1519 with five ships and proceeded to sail across the ocean with, without following any path. They're actually simply following the current of the waves. But in March 16, 1521, the Philippine Islands, specifically in Zamal, which is known today as Samar, has rediscovered by the Spanish Commission Authority, Ferdinand Magellan. The island where Magellan and his men stay is called Humono or Humonhon in present time. And they actually call the place Acuada de Libuene Signale or the watering place of good signs. On March 18, Ferdinand Magellan and his people saw nine men coming with them. Those people are the tribes or the Filipino people who lives in Samar. So the captain, Ferdinand Magellan, gave them drinks and foods and some red cups, looking glasses, combs, bells, ivory, and other things. When those um, Filipino people saw the politeness of the captain, they also presented some of their fish and a vessel of palm wine, which they call in their language, Uraka. So Uraka in our language today is Tuba. They also gave them um, Umay, Umay which is rice, cocos, and many other victuals. When we say cocos, it is the coconut. To explain the kind of fruits that was mentioned earlier, it must be known that the one which they call kuchi is the fruit which of the palm trees bear. Antonio Pigafetta also said that the bread, wine, vinegar, oil was all made by the palm trees. They also even make a hole at the summit of the trees as far as its heart, which is named palmetto. In the narration, Antonio Pigafetta wrote that those Filipino people who are who lives in Samar are being friendly with them. They even explained many things to them, including their language, and told them the names of the islands which they saw before everyone else. Furthermore, the tribes who lives in Samar and Ferdinand Magellan became friends. That they even called the place the archipelago of Saint Lazarus because they stayed there on the day of the feast of Saint Lazarus. Antonio Pigafetta also mentioned to his narration about how the Filipino tribes dress themselves. Like the le the leader of the tribes, Skion, have this um, gold ring suspended in his ears and others have these gold bracelets and rings near the island where Ferdinand Magellan and his people stay. There are people who wear holes in their ears that was so large that they could even pass their arms through them. These people are called Capre. And they just go naked except that round their middles that they wear that was made of bark of trees, which we call the present time Bahag. These people are tawny, fat, and painted, and they anoint themselves with the oil of coconuts and sesame to preserve them from the sun and the wind. Their hair is very black and long, reaching to the waist, and they carry small daggers and knives ornamented with gold and many other things, such as darts, harpoons, and nets of fish, and the like. So, on March 31, 1521, the first mass in the Philippines was held in Mazawa, or what we call nowadays as Limasawa. It was attended by Magellan, Raya Kulambu, or Raha Kulambu, Raya Siyawi, or Raha Siwagu, Spanish voyagers, and the local islanders. On April 7, 1521, Magellan and his men entered the port of Zubu. Initially, they encountered some struggle when they first entered the port of Zubu. Because the king of Zubu wanted Magellan and his men to pay tribute to them. But Magellan refused and told them that they were working for the king of Spain and threatened them for a war. In April 14, same year, the mass was held in Raya Humabun and his people attending the ceremony. Pagafeta shown the queen an image of 
of Our Lady, a very a very beautiful wooden child Jesus, and a cross that is now known as the Santo Nino found in Cebu. The Spanish cast anchor near the Mall of Seville and discharged all the artillery. Tuesday, they all went in shirts and barefoot with a taper in their hands to visit the shrine of St. Maria of Victory and of St. Maria de Andiga. Then, leaving Seville, they went to Valladolid, where Antonio Pigafetta presented to his sacred majesty Don Carlos neither gold nor silver, but things much more precious in the eyes of so great a sovereign. Antonio Pigafetta presented to him, among other things, a book written by his hand of all the things that had occurred day by day in their voyage. Antonio Pigafetta departed thence as he was best able and went to Portugal and related to King John the things which he had seen. Returning through Spain, Antonio Pigafetta came to France where he presented a few things from the other hemisphere to Madame Regent, mother of the most Christian king, Don Francis. Afterwards, he returned to Italy, where he established for even his adube and devoted his leisures and vigils to the very illustrious and noble lord, Philippe de Villiers de Lestadam the very worthy grandmaster of Rhodes. So, all I've said earlier is just a few information that was written in um, in the journal of Antonio Pigafetta in their expedition. For you to understand more the narration of Antonio Pigafetta about their first expedition, you should watch the movie Elcano and Magellan, The First Voyage Around the World. And the next is Lesson 2, The Customs of the Tagalog. We summarized the whole Lesson 2 since it is very long and this is how we came up. The Customs of the Tagalog, written by Fray Juan de Placencia, is one of the most important primary sources of the Philippine history. It tackles about the everyday living of the ancient Filipinos, their system of government, and their social statuses and their customs, traditions, and beliefs. This document is important for determining how the Spaniards will govern the Filipinos during the Spanish era. Although it has lesser value in the modern world right now, it is still important for us to trace the roots of, the, of who we are in the past. Early Filipinos were very much alike with the Malays based on their language, even before they came here in the Philippines. They were governed by a Datu who was like a king. Datus were highly respected and they have to follow whatever it commands. Not even the wife or the children of the Datu were exempted for getting a punishment when they disobeyed him. A Datu only governed a small group of people, approximately 100 houses only. The territory of a Datu is called Barangay, which came from the word Balangay or a boat they ride for transportation. Datus don't let other Datus conquer their land, and they only treat other Datus as a family, friend, ally, or an enemy. There was a caste system being followed in every barangay during that time. The highest social status was being a Maharlika, second is being a commoner, and the third is being a slave. The Maharlika, or the nobleman, also called freeborn people, don't pay taxes but they should accompany the Datu in everything he does. Next below it is being a commoner, also known as a leaping namamahay. They are slaves who serves their masters but has their own houses and has the right to own a property. The lowest class is the leaping sagigilid. They are those who were staying inside the houses of their, of their masters and they are the ones being sold to other people. In that time, debts are the main reason why there are times that the nobleman becomes a slave. Sometimes a slave came from the captives of war. In order for a slave to be set free, they have to pay a minimum amount of gold to their masters. Dividing a property is a pain during this time because of the social status of their parents. The one who gets the big part of the property is the one with the higher social status, and children of the Maharlikas from the slaves get the smallest part of the property. There are times when the Datus become a judge for the two opposing parties, 
so that the judgment will be fair and just. When two datus that doesn't get along with each other, they call other datus to be the mediator to prevent a war. Punishments that time were as brutal as being hanged or being put into a boiling water. Dowries are given by the men to the women. They enjoy the use of it. Provide the dowry has not been consumed the rest of the estate. Except in case the father should care to something and additional upon the daughter of her marriage and neither father and mother, she enjoy in such belong the relative child. We noticed the unmarried woman can own no property for the result of all their parents. The costumes are natives in all this laguna and the entire Tagalog race, some condemn and, and judge them with. In all the villages or other parts of the Philippines island, the adoration of their idol, if it, it, it true that they have the name Simbahan when they wish to celebrate a festival, which they called Pandot or worship they celebrate in the large of the chief with a rope to protect the people from the wet when a train on the coast of the house they sit is Molam, called Sorry Hell, brought into many designs, which was usually for days during this time the whole barangay or family united in the worship called Naga Anitus for the above mentioned period of time. Idols there was one called Badhala, the little same to signify all powerful. They also worship the sun, is almost universi universally respected, honor by helpers the moon. These natives had no established ambition of years, months, and days that determined by the cultivation of the soil, the different produce, the tree, and yielding flowers, fruits and leaves, making up the year of the winter and summer, a sun, time and water time, the winter region is the novel or ice. Their manner of offering sacrifice was to proclaim a feast such as mass and civet or storas tree and woods. Male or female who is called Catalona and generally by offering refuted health. These infidels say that was another life of rest. They called Maka, the say, should say, paradise, or in other words, village of rest and the valiant or who possess other moral virtues. There was a place of punishment, grief, and affliction called Kasan. This was called Patinance. May the honor and glory be God, our Lord, that among all the Tagalog trace of this life, thanks to the preaching of the Holy Gospel. Lesson 3 Works of Juan Luna and Fernando Amor Solo Casting of two men as the great painters in history, Lesson 3 will tackle about historical paintings. But first and foremost, we should know first about the definition of historical paintings. Historical paintings are visual representations of concrete happenings in the life of people in a specific period. The idea about certain events and people is, is communicated or expressed aesthetically through art with form, technique, and style. Essentially, these paintings are instrumental to the visualization of reality which stands equally with text, photos, caricatures, and films. The following that we were going to tackle are the specific samples of historical paintings which were made by the two great Filipino painters. We as humans can create imaginative things to possibly happen just like what they did. The first painter that we tackled on his work was Juan Luna, a novicio widely known Juan Luna. 
He was born in the year October 23, 1857 in Badoc, Ilocos Norte and a well-off family. Two of his great masterpieces made him famous in the history of painting. To begin with, we will tackle about Espolarium. Juan Luna painted Espolarium in the year 1884. This is the most valuable oil on canvas painting with a size of 4.22 meters by 7.675 meters, making it the largest painting in the Philippines. It won first gold medal in 1884 as an entry to the prestigious Exposition de Villas Artes in Madrid. The painting features a glimpse of Roman history centered on the bloody massacre brought by the gladiatorial tournaments. Espolarium is a Latin word referring to the basement of the Roman Colosseum where the fallen and dying gladiators are tossed out and devoid of their worldly possessions. It is a silhouette of Roman brutality as an allegory for the state of the Philippines under the Spanish rule. And also, one of Juan Luna's masterpieces is the Parisian Life, created way back in 1892. The Parisian Life is also known as the Incurior Dion Cafe or Inside a Cafe, even referred to in some books as The Maid and On Cocaine or someone who is one point lower than the prostitute. As a cultural and historical artwork, the Parisian life does not solely embody the intangible ideas of the national consciousness, but also Luna's talent as an artist. Juan Luna died on December 7, 1899 in British Hong Kong. The second Great painters in history that we will tackle is Fernando Amorzolo. Fernando Amorzolo also marks his legacy in the painting industry. Fascinating people of his impressionistic technique depicting idyllic country scenes, beautiful maidens, and colorfully dressed peasants planting or harvesting rice. The paintings are significant of the development of the formation of Filipino notions of self and identity. He is popularly known for his craftsmanship and mastery in the use of light. Fernando Morsolo was born on May 30, 1892 in the Paco district of Manila. At this juncture, we will tackle his two artworks. First is the Antipolo Fiesta. This oil painting on canvas depicts a rural scene which scene where a group of people is shown celebrating a fiesta in Antipolo. The main emphasis is on a pair of dancers in the field surrounded by revelers both young and old. This painting exemplifies the simple life of Filipino way back then. It also shows our culture and traditions and also compares with the Filipino provincial life way back then, especially in a particular area in Antipolo. And the last one is the Palay Maiden or the Lagang Bukid, painted way back in 1920 using oil on canvas. This painting portrays a provincial Filipina beauty or the Lagang Bukid during a rice harvest and dress in an envelope by the colors of the Philippine flag. Palay is Tagalog for grain, which is symbolic of the Philippines' most staple crop. And Maiden bears significance to Amorzola's preference for beauty. Fernando Amorzolo, who died in 1972, is said to have painted more than 10,000 copies. That would be the topic that encompasses in Lesson 3. I am your reporter, Rochelle Sihayag. Thank you very much and to God be the glory. Lesson 4, The Political Caricatures The understanding of politics and society in a certain period of time can be known and understood not only through text but also through cartoons or caricatures. 
So, the meaning of a political caricature is a type of drawing that is used to present a comment, opinion, or criticism on a particular event, persons, and situation. It's also known as editorial cartoon found in newspaper. So, a political cartoon or caricature is a type of editorial cartoon in which nagpakita siya sa imuhang comments or opinion but in a editorial way or cartoon way. So, the importance of caricature is here in the Philippines, history outline of the Philippines political cartoon, a drawing made for the purpose of conveying editorial commentary on politics, politician and current events such cartoon play are such cartoon plays a role in the political discourse of a society that provides for freedom of speech of the press so here is some example of political caricature and and for me the meaning of this is in martial law some armies Sarm armies, gamit nila ilang power, not in a not in a positive way, but kanang ilang giabusaran. So, many cases sa martial law atong in the Marcos era, Marcos presidency, na daghay na matay, it's because of some nga mga armies kay nag nag abusar sa ilang servisyo. Good day everyone, my name is Sarabella Tagana and I am the reporter for the topic of Lesson 5 which is all about the speech of Grazon C. Aquino. But first and foremost, let's talk about first the biography of the former President Grazon Aquino. Grazon Aquino is the first female president of the Philippines. Her full name is Maria Corazon Sumulong Cuanco Aquino. She was born on January 25, 1933, in Paniki, Tarlac, located in Central Luzon, Philippines, north of Manila. She passed away on August 1, 2009 at the age of 76. As a young girl, Corazon Aquino was studious and shy. She also showed a devout commitment to the Catholic Church from an early age. Corazon went to expensive private schools in Manila through age 13, when her parents sent her to the United States for high school. Corazon went first to the Philadelphia's Raven Hill Academy and then the Notre Dame Convent School in New York, graduating in 1949. As an undergraduate at the College of Mount St. Vincent in New York City, Corazon Aquino major in French. She also fluent in Tagalog, Kapangpangan, and English. On February 25, 1986, as a result of the People Power Revolution, Corazon Aquino became the first female president of the Philippines. She restored democracy to the country, promulgated a new constitution, and served until 1992. President Aquino's tenure was not entirely smooth. She pledged agrarian reform and land redistribution, but her background as a member of the landed classes made this a difficult promise to keep. Corazon Aquino also convinced the U.S. to withdraw its military from remaining bases in the Philippines, with help from Mount Pinatubo, which erupted in June 1991 and buried several military installations. Marcos supporters in the Philippines staged a half dozen cop attempts against Corazon Aquino during her term in office, but she survived them all in her lucky and stubborn political style. Although her allies urged her to run for a second term in 1992, she adamantly refused. The new 1987 constitution forbade second terms, but her supporters argue that she was elected before the constitution came into effect and did not apply to her. Corazon Aquino had a tremendous impact on her nation and the world's perception of women in power. She has been described as both the mother of Philippine democracy and as the housewife who led a revolution. 
Aquino has been honored both during and after her lifetime with major international awards including the United Nations Silver Medal, the Eleanor Roosevelt Human Rights Award, and the Women and the Women's International Center International Leadership Living Legacy Award. The speech presented in this lesson was obtained from an official gazette which is an official journal of the Republic of the Philippines. This speech was delivered by the late Corazon C. Aquino in the U.S. Congress, Washington, D.C. on September 18, 1986, six months after assumption into office as a President of the Republic of the Philippines. Included here is a portion of President Corazon Aquino's transcript of her speech and the link where the video can be found. Members of the Congress, it is my great privilege and I deem it a high honor and personal privilege to present to you Her Excellency Corazon C. Aquino, President of the Republic of the Philippines. Mr. Speaker, Senator Thurmond, distinguished members of Congress. Three years ago, I left America in grief to bury my husband, Ninoy Aquino. I thought I had left it also to lay to rest his restless dream of Philippine freedom. Today, I have returned as the president of a free people. In burying Ninoy, a whole nation honored him by that brave and selfless act of giving honor a nation in shame recovered its own. A country that had lost faith in its future found it in a faithless and brazen act of murder. So in giving we receive, in losing we find, and out of defeat we snatched our victory. For the nation, Ninoy became the pleasing sacrifice that answer their prayers for freedom. For myself and our children, Ninoy was a loving husband and father. His loss three times in our lives was always a deep and painful one. Fourteen years ago this month was the first time we lost him. A president turned dictator and traitor to his oath suspended the Constitution and shut down the Congress that was much like this one before which I am honored to speak. He detained my husband along with thousands of others, senators, publishers, and anyone who had spoken up for the democracy as its end drew near. But for Ninoy, a long and cruel ordeal <clears throat> was reserved. The dictator already knew that Ninoy was not a body merely to be imprisoned, but a spirit he must break. For even as the dictatorship demolished one by one the institutions of democracy, the press, the Congress, the independence of the judiciary, the protection of the Bill of Rights, Ninoy kept their spirit alive in himself. The government sought to break him by indignities and terror. They locked him up in a tiny, nearly airless cell in a military camp in the north. They stripped him naked and held the threat 
of a sudden midnight execution over his head. Ninoy held up manfully under all of it. I barely did as well. For 43 days, the authorities would not tell me what had happened to him. This was the first time my children and I felt we had lost him. When that didn't work, they put him on trial for subversion, murder, and a host of other crimes before a military commission. <clears throat> Dinoy challenged its authority and went on a fast. If he survived it, then he felt God intended him for another fate. We had lost him again, for nothing would hold him back from his determination to see his fast through to the end. He stopped only when it dawned on him that the government would keep his body alive after the fast had destroyed his brain. And so with barely any life in his body, he called off the fast on the 40th day. God meant him for other things, he felt. He did not know that an early death would still be his fate, that only the timing was wrong. At any time during his long ordeal, Ninoy could have made a separate peace with a dictatorship, as so many of his countrymen had done. But the spirit of democracy that inheres in our race and animates this chamber could not be allowed to die. He held out in the loneliness of his cell and the frustration of exile, the democratic alternative to the insatiable greed and mindless cruelty of the right and the purging holocaust of the left. And then we lost him irrevocably and more painfully than in the past. The news came to us in Boston. It had to be after the three happiest years of our lives together. But his death was my country's resurrection in the courage and faith by which alone they could be free again. The dictator had called him a nobody. Yet two million people threw aside their passivity and fear and escorted him to his grave. And so began the revolution that has brought me to democracy's most famous home, the Congress of the United States. The task had fallen on my shoulders to continue offering the democratic alternative to our people. Archibald MacLeish had said that democracy must be defended by arms when it is attacked by arms and by truth when it is attacked by lies. He failed to say how it shall be won. I held fast to Ninoy's conviction that it must be by the ways of democracy. I held out for participation in the 1984 election the dictatorship called, even if I knew it would be rigged. I was warned by the lawyers of the opposition that I ran the grave risk of legitimizing the foregone results of elections that were clearly going to be fraudulent. But I was not fighting for lawyers but for the people in whose intelligence I had implicit faith. By the exercise of democracy, even in a dictatorship, they would be prepared for democracy when it came. And then also, it was the only way I knew by which we could measure our power, even in the terms dictated by the dictatorship. The people vindicated me in an election shamefully marked by government thuggery and fraud. The opposition swept the elections, garnering a clear majority of the votes, even if they ended up, thanks to a corrupt commission on elections, 
with barely a third of the seats in Parliament. Now I knew our power. Last year, in an excess of arrogance, the dictatorship called for its doom in a snap election. The people obliged. With over a million signatures, they drafted me to challenge the dictatorship, and I obliged. The rest is the history that dramatically unfolded on your television screens and across the front pages of your newspapers. You saw a nation armed with courage and integrity stand fast by democracy against threats and corruption. You saw women poll watchers break out in tears as armed goons crash the polling places to steal the ballots. But just the same, they tied themselves to the ballot boxes. You saw a people so committed to the ways of democracy that they were prepared to give their lives for its pale imitation. At the end of the day, before another wave of fraud could distort the results, I announced the people's victory. Many of you here today played a part in changing the policy of your country towards ours. We, the Filipinos, thank each of you for what you did, for balancing America's strategic interests against human concerns, illuminates the American vision of the world. The co-chairman of the United States Observer Team in his report to the President said, I was witness to an extraordinary manifestation of democracy on the part of the Filipino people. The ultimate result was the election of Mrs. Corazon Aquino as President and Mr. Salvador Laurel as Vice President of the Philippines. When a subservient parliament announced my opponent's victory, the people then turned out in the streets and proclaimed me the president of all the people. And true to their word, when a handful of military leaders declared themselves against the dictatorship, the people rallied to their protection. Surely the people take care of their own. It is on that faith and the obligation it entails that I assumed the presidency. As I came to power peacefully, so shall I keep it. That is my contract with my people and my commitment to God. He had willed that the blood drawn with the lash shall not in my country be paid by blood drawn by the sword, but by the tearful joy of reconciliation. We have swept away absolute power by a limited revolution that respected the life and freedom of every Filipino. Now we are restoring full constitutional government. Again, as we restore democracy by the ways of democracy, so are we completing the constitutional structures of our new democracy under a constitution that already gives full respect to the Bill of Rights. A jealously independent constitutional commission is completing its draft, which will be submitted later this year to a popular referendum. When it is approved, there will be elections for both national and local positions. So within about a year from a peaceful but national upheaval that overturned a dictatorship, we shall have returned to full constitutional gov government. 
Given the polarization and breakdown we inherited, this is no small achievement. My predecessor set aside democracy to save it from a communist insurgency that numbered less than 500. Unhampered by respect for human rights, he went at it with hammer and tongs. By the time he fled, that insurgency had grown to more than 16,000. I think there is a lesson here to be learned about trying to stifle a thing with the means by which it grows. I don't think... I don't think anybody in or outside our country concerned for a democratic and open Philippines doubts what must be done. Through political initiatives and local reintegration programs, we must seek to bring the insurgents down from the hills and by economic progress and justice, show them that which the best intentioned among them fight. As president of all my people, I will not betray the cause of peace by which I came to power. Yet equally and again, no friend of Filipino democracy will challenge this. I will not stand by and allow an insurgent leadership to spurn our offer of peace and kill our young soldiers and threaten our new freedom. Yet, I must explore the path of peace to the utmost, for at its end, whatever disappointment I meet there is the moral basis for laying down the olive branch of peace and taking up the sword of war. Still, should it come to that, I will not waver from the course laid down by your great liberator. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and for his orphans, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Like Abraham Lincoln, I understand that force may be necessary before mercy. Like Lincoln, I don't relish it. Yet I will do whatever it takes to defend the integrity and freedom of my country. <laughs> Finally, may I turn to that other slavery, our $26 billion foreign debt. I have said that we shall honor it. Yet the means by which we shall be able to do so are kept from us. Many of the conditions imposed on the previous government that stole this debt continue to be imposed on us who never benefited from it. And no assistance or liberality commensurate with the calamity that was visited on us has been extended. Yet ours must have been the cheapest revolution ever.
With little help from others, we Filipinos fulfill the first and most difficult condition of the debt negotiation, the full restoration of democracy and responsible government. Elsewhere and in other times of more stringent world economic conditions, Marshall plans and their like were felt to be necessary companions of returning democracy. When I met with President Reagan, we began an important dialogue about cooperation and the strengthening of friendship between our two countries. That meeting was both a confirmation and a new beginning. I am sure it will lead to positive results in all areas of common concern. Today, we face the aspiration of a people who had known so much poverty and massive unemployment for the past 14 years, and yet offer their lives for the abstraction of democracy. Wherever I went in the campaign, slum area or impoverished village, they came to me with one cry, democracy. Not food, although they clearly needed it, but democracy. Not work, although they surely wanted it, but democracy. Not money, for they gave what little they had to my campaign. They didn't expect me to work a miracle that would instantly put food into their mouths, clothes on their back, education in their children and give them work that will put dignity in their lives. But I feel the pressing obligation to respond quickly as the leader of a people so deserving of all these things. We face a communist insurgency that feeds on economic deterioration, even as we carry a great share of the free world defenses in the Pacific. These are only two of the many burdens my people carry, even as they try to build a worthy and enduring house for their new democracy that may serve as well as a redoubt for freedom in Asia. Yet no sooner is one stone laid than two are taken away. Half our export earnings, two billion dollars out of four billion dollars which is all we can earn in the restrictive markets of the world, must go to pay just the interest on a debt whose benefit the Filipino people never received. Still, we fought for honor, and if only for honor, we shall pay. And yet, should we have to wring the payments from the sweat of our men's faces, and sink all the wealth piled up by the bondsmen's 250 years of unrequited toil. Yet, to all Americans, as the leader of a proud and free people, I address this question. Has there been a greater test of national commitment to the ideals you hold dear than that my people have gone through? You have spent many lives and much treasure to bring freedom to many lands that were reluctant to receive it. And here you have a people who want it by themselves and need only the help to preserve it. ago I said, thank you America for the haven from oppression and the home you gave Ninoy, myself and our children and for the three happiest years of our lives together. 
Today I say, join us, America, as we build a new home for democracy, another haven for the oppressed, so it may stand as a shining testament of our two nations' commitment to freedom. understanding about the speech, it is simply entails that former Philippine President Corazon C. Aquino called on America to assist our country in maintaining freedom in a speech to the United States Congress in September 1986. The former president had the perspective towards the Filipino people in terms of equality such as rights, economic status, and even social services. Cory Aquino's speech began and ended with numerous references to her husband, former Senator Nino Aquino, whom the Filipino nation had designated as the anti-Marcos standard bearer. Her speech was intended to link Nino's struggle with that of the entire country, while also connecting their family's history with the country's fate. In front of the United States, she justified her presence. On the one hand, Congress used symbolic words and figurative language, referring to her relationship with the late Nino Aquino, and on the other, fulfilling her command to the Filipino people. She was successful in her analysis of the origins and outcomes of the martial law era. Her speech is notable in Philippine history because it epitomized how Filipino will go to any duration to gain freedom. Cory shared her experiences and sorrows about losing a loving husband and a good father to her family in her speech to the U.S. Congress. She gave a brief account of how Marcos suspended the Philippine Constitution and shut down the Congress, leading to Nino's exile and death, highlighting the militaries and dictators' inhumane treatment. She went on to explain how the challenge of freeing the Filipinos and fighting for democracy fell on her shoulders as a result of this. She spoke about her personal experience with the Commission on Elections Corruption and praised the people's, in the, people's unity and courage in the face of oppression. As the country's new president, she outlined some of her plans to rebuild the government, beginning with reinstituting and amending the Philippine Constitution, as well as launching peace and reconciliation uh, programs to help the country's various regions heal. And that was the end of Chapter 2. I, as well as the reporters in this chapter, are hoping that all of you learn something from us.